I was giving y'all time to turn to Exodus chapter 40 because some of y'all were struggling. <laughs> Verse 33. <clears throat> then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. That's what he did. And so Moses finished the work. Somebody said finished. He was done with it. I hung the courts. I hung the curtains. I'm done. I'm finished. Look at this, y'all. Verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Oh, my God. And Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I'm going to drop back to the latter part of verse 33 and 34. And so Moses, when he finished the work, he finished, then the cloud covered the tent. I want to use for a simple subject this morning, some assembly required. That's my subject. There's some assembly Required. Bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, we began on the first Sunday of this year, and I told you that God has given us a mandate and set our North Star, letting us know we're going to focus on being intentional this year. Not just emotional, but being intentional. And so I began the conversation on last week, and I'm going to continue the conversation on this week. Because I believe that for the things that God wants us to do, he wants us to be intelligent and not just emotional. That he doesn't want us to be excited about things that we do not receive. And I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of shouting over stuff that I do not receive. And sometimes it's not because God doesn't want you to have it. It's because we are not intentional in how we handle our money, our relationships, our business, and our ministries. And so I'm going to challenge you to not just put on your spiritual head this, ears this morning, but put on your intelligentsia, put on your thinking caps as we consider what God wants to talk to us about the subject of some assembly being required. Sometimes products like furniture or children's toys will have a little label on them that says some assembly required. You ever seen that? Especially if you go to, go to Ikea, you go to Ikea, they have all those signs there that say that some assembly is going to be required. And what that means, to assemble something means to put it together from a bunch of different parts. It means that at least some of it, you're going to have to put together yourself. Some assembly is required. That it's not just going to pop out the box as a finished product, but you have to exercise some elbow grease and work together with the manufacturer's intentions and your efforts to produce the thing that you desire. There has to at least be some level of cooperation between the manufacturer and the builder to achieve the outcomes that you desire. I thought about that when I saw that on a recent project that I had at home. I saw that label, and I thought about it because when it comes to the construction and the manufacture and of your life, the Bible says to me this. It says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did you hear that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so in the same way, there is a participation between you and God to achieve the life that he intends for you to have. Listen, it's not going to be all you and it's not going to be all God. And that's where people get it twisted. So you think that it's going to be all you. And see, if it's all you, then you can brag and say, my strength and my power has brought me this. Y'all remember when God was talking to Israel, when she was coming into the promised land, and he told them to be careful, I'm going to warn you, when you get into the promised land, when you come into all the things that you expect to have, when you come into your, your great place, don't get over there and start tripping. And start talking about my strength and my power and my ability got me this. And forget that it was the Lord God who gave you power to get wealth. That's what happens with some of us, too. We start tripping. 
as soon as we get a little bit of position, a little bit of power, a little bit of influence, you got a couple of, a couple of letters behind your name, then you start acting like my power has given me the ability to do this. This was me. It was all about me. And you forget that it was God that gave you the ability to do whatever it is that you have done. He gave you the strength to do the job. You do the typing, but God gave you the strength. You got the job, but God gave you the intellect. You got the, the, the opportunity, but God opened the door and said, look at somebody and say, don't start tripping. And forget that it was God who gave you the power, the ability to get the wealth that you have. For some reason, when we get a little something, something, we get amnesia. We get amnesia, and we don't realize that if God hadn't blessed you, you wouldn't even have whatever it is that you have. There are a whole lot of people that have a degree, and all of them ain't doing what you do. There's a whole lot of people with a PhD, and some of them are working somewhere that is beneath the degree that they have. There's a whole lot of cute people. God, God got cute people everywhere, but everybody doesn't have what you have, what you possess. And so don't ever get to a place where you think that it was all about you. I can do it. Yes, I had to do it, but I did all things through Christ. Let me see if I make it more plain. The way it works, you cooperate with God. You supply the desire. And God gives the anointing. You hear what I'm saying? Here's the cooperation between me and God. I can do, this is going to be your part, and then God's going to do it through me. That it's not going to be all you and it's not going to be all God. But there's going to be a cooperation. And one of the things we need discernment about and prayer about is God, what is it that I'm supposed to do? And then what is it that you're supposed to do? Because there are some things that God is waiting on you to do while you're standing there waiting for God to do it. You supply the desire. God gives the anointing. Oh. He, he, he supplies the anointing, the divine enablement. Check this out. You supply the obedience. Just do what he tells you to do. And then he supplies the glory. Woo. I hope you don't let me preach them. I'm going to talk this morning. So in our text, in our text, Moses is instructed to build a tabernacle, a tent, a meeting place, a place of worship in all places in the wilderness. He was instructed by God to build it. It was not Moses' idea to build a tent or a place of worship. The idea started with God himself. I must underscore that because if you decide to build something on your own, God is not obligated to bless it. The tabernacle was Moses, was not Moses' idea. It started with God. It's important as we take this January, and I want to slow down here, take this January, this first part of the year, and spend some time with God and get in his face and get with our teams because we want a God idea, just not a good idea. This isn't the first time that the Israelites pulled together their resources to build something. The first time they built something, when you do something that's your idea, you end up building a golden calf. That's what happens when ideas start with you. When the idea started with them, they said, let's build a golden calf and worship it. But when it was God's idea, they built a place that will worship God. And if you build something that is born with you, you have a tendency to worship your own ideas. And the problem with many of us is you worship your own ideas. You worship your own intellect. You, you, you're in the habit of coming up with an idea and then run to God. As opposed to saying, God, what is that you want me to do? And so Moses spent 40 days in the mountain with God and let God give him instructions for what he wanted built, not what you wanted built. I'm going to challenge you in this message this morning to spend some time alone with God, to spend some time in prayer, to slow down for a moment and begin to respect God and say, God, what do you want me to build? What, am I try what, what is it that you want me to produce? I'm tired of failing and bringing things and creating things that you are not in. I'm tired of getting relationships with people that you are not in. Y'all not going to talk to me. 
I'm tired of chasing ideas and things that do not work because it was not what you called for. Do you have enough faith to abandon what you think it should be and trust God to do what he wants it to be? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so what we're watching here in this verse are the final touches. The final touches. God, he hung the curtain. He was done. God had given them instructions in the mountain. He came down and they began to build the thing that God had given him. And God was specific about what he wanted. Notice how many times the writer, if you go back, we don't have time today, but if you go back to the first verse and read all the way down to where we are, notice how many times the writer repeats the phrase, as the Lord commanded. I count at least eight times. Every time Moses made something, when he made the altar, he did it as the Lord commanded. When he hung the curtains, he did it as the Lord commanded. When they cut the boards and when they sewed the material together, they did it as the Lord commanded. When they put the brazen labor out there, they did it as the Lord commanded. You see that phrase repeated over and over again. It's, re it's repeated at least eight times in this chapter alone, underscoring the importance of following instructions. The problem with many of us is you don't follow instructions. First, you don't stop to get instruction. And then when you get instruction, you don't follow the instruction that you've been given and then wonder why it don't work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You wonder why the marriage doesn't work. You wonder why what you're doing with the kids doesn't work. You wonder why the business doesn't work. You wonder why the department doesn't work. You wonder why the ministry does not work. No matter how much effort you're putting into it, is it possible that you are not following the instructions that God has given for what he intended and not what you intended? Oh, my God. This is the problem I believe is wrong with the church because we are steady trying to build something that God didn't call for. And so, therefore, you can't tell the difference between the church and the club because we don't build what God is calling for. We're building what we think the church ought to be. I'm going to get off it. When Moses had done everything according to God's instruction, here it is. Then the glory fell. There is a direct connection between his glory and your obedience. And you have need of patience, as the Bible said, that after you have done the will of God, then you might receive the promise. Some of us, the issue is you want the promise before you do the work. That God has given you an assignment. He has given you instructions. He has told you, I want you to do this, to accomplish this, to say this, to build that. And after you do it, my glory will fall. But what you want is you want the pay before you do the work. How does that work? You can't show up at a job and say, pay me, and then I'll do the work. You get paid after you do the work. Come on, y'all know what I'm saying. And God said, after you've been obedient, after you've done what I told you to do, then the glory will fall. And what you need in between the instruction and God's glory is patience. Some of you, the issue is you don't have patience. It's not my strong suit either. You don't have patience to wait. There is a waiting period between the finishing of the job and the glory that begins to fall. But if you don't do what he asks you to do, you can't expect to have the glory that he promised to give you. Are you am I talking to anybody in here? Look at somebody and say, you need patience. I was with the men yesterday. Praise God for all the men in here. Give God praise for them. We were meeting with the men yesterday and giving them instructions for 2024. And one of the points I made to them is that this is not going to be a quick fight. This is going to be a 12-round fight. That for some of you, it's not about having more strength or more power. It's about having more patience. You ever see some of those fights? Some of those fights like Mike Tyson, he would knock you out in 30 seconds. You can go to the bathroom and it'd be over. 30 seconds, one round, it's done. But there are some fights that last eight, nine, ten rounds. And when things are having a last eight, nine, and ten rounds, it's not about power, it's about stamina. 
It's about standing there. It's about having patience. And God said to tell somebody in here, this fight that you're going to fight right now is not about strength. It's about patience. It's about you outlasting it. It's about you having done all to stand and stand there. Do you have enough strength to stand there and wait for what God's about to do? I did the work. I did what I was supposed to do. I was obedient. And now I'm going to wait until the glory falls on it. Y'all not talking to me this morning. Some of you are losing the battle because you don't have patience. So you're walking away from the marriage, away from the kids, away from the opportunity because it didn't happen yesterday. But look at somebody say, stand there. Have some patience. You have need of patience that after, not before, after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So check yourself. Check yourself. Check yourself and ask yourself, what are you building with your life? What are you building on with your life? And number two, is this something that was sanctioned by God? Is it possible that the glory hasn't fallen because you're giving him something he didn't ask for anyway. And you're putting all that energy and all that effort and all that money into something that God didn't ask for. He didn't ask Moses, what do you want to build? It didn't start with him. He didn't come in there with an idea and say, God, I got a good idea for a tabernacle. That's not how that went. God said, Moses, this is the instructions. This is what I want built, and I want you to be careful to make sure you build it exactly the way I want to. And when he did what he was told, the glory fell. So I want to share a few things with you this morning. Let me talk to you about the gathering. Write this down. I'm trying to show you how to get the glory to fall in your life. Some assembly is required. Let's talk about the gathering. You know, whenever a house is constructed, is constructed especially from the ground up, it doesn't arrive completed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They will drop off the boards, the glass, steel, whatever it is, all the, all the materials for the house, but it doesn't come completed. They drop it off on the lawn, and then somebody has to come along and put together the pieces that have been dropped off. It arrives in pieces, the boards, the nails, the glass. It arrives in pieces, but guess what? It has a blueprint. A template. You're not guessing at it. You're not just throwing things together. First comes the blueprint, then comes the product. The problem with many of us is you just start grabbing things, start putting it together according to whatever you think. It, I think the boards ought to go here. I think the window ought to go here. What God did with Moses was give God the was give Moses the blueprint. It was the plan, it was the template, and then they were now supposed to build what God had given them, and God was giving them the raw pieces to put together. Whenever God calls you, what he gives you is raw ingredients. You don't get it out the box. Oh, my Lord. You got to put it together. We want things to come complete. I tell people that's, that's trying to be married and trying to get married, you, 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 don't, you, you, wanna, you wanna walk out and have a marriage complete. <laughs> you can have a wedding in one day, but it's going to take you years to have a relationship. And you're comparing yourself in three weeks to somebody who's been married 30 years. It don't come out perfect. You got to work with it. Raising kids is a process. They don't walk out knowing everything. You have to teach them. You have to train them. You have to work with them. You have to develop them. They are growing more and more independent, but it's a long time between the time you birth them and the time that they're ready to step out into the world. It's a process. There it is. It's a process. When you're building a ministry, it's a process. You can't compare a ministry that's been here for three years to a ministry that's been here for 30 years. Oh, they got excellence over there. Well, they've been doing it for 30 years. You're still taking baby steps. You're still learning the things that they have already done. Why? Because it's a process. What you're seeing is God gathering the raw ingredients. When God promises you something, it typically doesn't come in complete form. Look at a tree. It doesn't show up as a full-grown tree. It shows up as a seed. But everything the tree needs is already in the seed. 
Can I talk this morning without hooping? What am I saying? I'm saying to you that God says, I have given you the raw ingredients. I've already put it in your hands. I've already put in you and around you everything I need to produce the life that you're supposed to have, but you're going to have to put it together. One person put it like this. He said that life is God's gift to you. What you make of it is your gift to God. Can I say that again? Life is God's gift to you. He gives you life. He gives you air. He gives you wind. He gives you strength. You, nobody in here has anything that nobody else has in here. Everybody in here has 24 hours. God gives you the mind, the intellect, the ability, and what you make of that life, what you build, what you create, will be your gift to God. Look at somebody says, my gift to God. I, I, I'm going to share a true story with you. I was... Uh, I, I put a chandelier in my home, uh, Jill, not long ago. I put a chandelier in my, we went to a store and we saw this amazing chandelier and we wanted to hang it in our porch and uh, it looked beautiful in the showroom. And uh, when we went to pick it up, it didn't look like the, what, what it looked like on the showroom. <laughs> they gave me a box with some pieces in it. It wasn't in finished form. It was just in a box, a little slim box. The chandelier is about this big, but the box they gave me was about this big because it was in pieces. There was going to be some assembly required. Y'all follow me? Not only that, when I opened up the box, the instruction said this, and I laughed to myself. It says, before you attempt to assemble it, to make sure you have, all the pieces. Now, they must have wrote that for a man. Because <laughs> typically, I would dive in. When I used to put my kids' bicycles together, I'd just dive in and start putting things together. I know what I'm doing, and inevitably, there'd be something wrong. I have a handful of pieces and washers, and how many of you got some men that do that? You just jump right in and start working, but you're missing things and, and stuff is left off. And what's this for? I don't know. You threw it away and you end up throwing away something that you really needed. Now they were riding down the street and the, and the tire pop off the bicycle. <laughs> the brakes don't work. The handlebars fall off because you thought you presumed that you were smart enough to put something together without following instructions. Somebody's getting me now. And you presume that you're smart enough to put your life together without following God's instructions. Yeah, you think you know everything. You've been here 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. God has been here from eternity past. And now you presume to know everything and th and <laughs> without following instructions. But anyway, I digress. Lee, went to put up this chandelier. And I laid out all the parts like I was supposed to. This time I was going to be smart because I've done that. I've been guilty of just building stuff without following instruction. I will admit that. But this time I was going to be smart. And I decided to follow the instructions explicitly. And they said to make sure you have all the parts. Well, bless my soul. I, got, I put everything out like I was supposed to and found out I was missing pieces. I was missing pieces. And the pieces were so important that if I didn't have, and they weren't big pieces, they were small pieces, but they were so important that I wasn't going to get the results I wanted without these pieces. So important were these pieces that I hired professional contractors to hang it up for me, Brother Tao. And what should have taken 20 minutes ended up taking three and a half, almost four hours as they're wrestling with trying to hang this chandelier. And the only thing was wrong is... It didn't have all the pieces. It got so bad, Brother James, I came outside to check on my contractors. They had gotten to a fight. I walked out, what's going on? They got into a fight. I mean, almost a fist fight. They was cussing. They was mad. They snatched the stuff off the ceiling, left it on the ground. One guy was packing up his truck. He was cussing on his way down the street. I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. All this happened, all this drama, craziness, confusion, time wasted, all because it was missing pieces. It was a $3 piece that was missing that I politely went to Home Depot and brought it back and put the thing up in 15 minutes while they fought and wrestled and cussed and fell out 
and was about to not get what I intended because it was missing pieces. It's a funny story, but some of you right now are not getting the results that you want because your life is missing pieces. What's missing from your life that is preventing you to being, from being the woman of God that God has called for? Maybe you're missing prayer. Maybe you're missing study in God's word. Maybe you're missing the right relationships. Maybe you're not connecting with the right people. I'm telling you right now, you're always going to be frustrated. You're going to be angry. You're not going to get the results you want for something as simple as missing pieces. I want you to do a self-inventory right now in your life and say, God, what am I missing? I'm missing something. I know that you want me to be blessed. I know that you want me to be favored. I know that you want me to be successful. I know that it is your will that I be healed, that I be delivered, that I be set free. But what am I missing? What am I missing? Who am I missing? That's why it's important who you connect with. Because sometimes the outcome that you're missing is because you are missing pieces. And what you're going to have to do in this season in January is start doing inventory on your life and figure out what you're missing. Before you try to build anything, before you try to build a ministry, before you try to build a marriage, before you say, I do, what are you missing? You're focused on what you have, and God's trying to talk to you about what you're missing. And the bad thing is that sometimes you don't know what you're missing. This is why talking to God is important, because God will begin to tell you, I need you to add this to your life. I need you to spend more time in my word. I need you to spend less time on Facebook and more time in the book. Y'all want me to stick my finger in my ear and preach. I'm trying to talk to you this morning. I want you to spend less time in gossip. I want you to shut down this relationship. This relationship that you insist on having is impacting what I have for you. Some of you don't want to hear it, but some of the people that you're connecting with, it is not God's will. I know you don't want to hear it. I know they're cute. I know this looked like it might be the one, but that's why your last relationship didn't work before because you didn't consult God to ask, is this the one? You just thought this is Mr. Right Now. Oops, there it is. <laughs> what am I missing, God? But when Moses began to put together the tabernacle, he put together everything just the way God told him to. I'm going to say this to you. I've been praying for God to stir up gifts in this house. That God send us gifted people. And God has been answering my prayer. What you're seeing coming into this church and what you're going to begin to see are people is the gathering of the gifted. God has given us a blueprint, a template, a design that he once created. And now he's sending us gifted people to help us create not what Faison wants, but what God wants. Oh, my God. Look at somebody say, is it you? Is it you? Is it you? If you notice, if you notice Moses himself never picked up a hammer. He never picked up a nail. He never picked up a saw. What he did was supervising. He was the foreman. His job was to take what God gave him and make sure that what was being built was according to what God asked for. And so he was anal about it because God told him to do it exactly the way I told you to do it. So his job was to walk around and say, no, no, God said, mm -mm, take that down. I want you to use silver knobs, okay? No, nope. look at the blueprint. Look at what you're building. No, nope, we're not doing it. No, nope. no, no, no. God said put the table of showbread over there. Well, I think we ought to put it here. It's not what you think. It's what God asked for. Y'all not following me today. Y'all got to wake up. He, he, he put, put the table of showbread over here and then put the laver over there. And I want you to put the, uh, the candelabra over there. No, no, put, 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 put the altar with the incense right here. It wasn't about what they thought it should be. It was about what God asked for. Even when it comes to your life, God is specific. God is into details. You're talking about a God who created the universe, who created the world and made everything function the way it is. You're talking about a God who created your body and made it as wonderful as it is. God is specific. Do you not think that God is specific about your life? 
that there are certain things he's saying, put this over here, put that over there. It's not what you think. It's what I'm telling you to do. And when you do it the way I tell you to do, you'll get the results that you are looking for. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? He was specific. God is into details. If you read the book of Exodus, when you get some time, go back and read the tabernacle. God is in the details. He was right down into how long the boards should be. He was right down to what colors you should use. He was right down to how high the curtains are. God was so specific. He told them when the priest came in, he told them what kind of material they were supposed to use in their robes. And then he told them what colors to make the robes out of. And he was specific about the stones that would be on the roof. God decked his priests out and he was specific. He was detailed. I don't want, well, I think you ought to put a carpet down here. God said, no, put a dirt floor. That's how some of you are having frustration right now because God keeps trying to tell you what it should be, but you're trying to tell him how it should be. He was specific. I was walking around the building yesterday, and I was pointing around different things that we need to change or fix or alter, and one of my deacons said, Pastor, are you OCD? I said, no, I'm just, uh, I'm just in the details. That sometimes the devil is in the details. That I'm trying to work according to a pattern. I'm trying to work according to a template that's been given to me. So I'm always looking at the template and I'm always looking at what we're building. And if what we're building does not match the template, we have to move it, change it, and alter it. Because God is into the details. If God is talking to you about any area of your life, you can't just blow him off and say it's not important. It is important. Why was it important that Moses built it according to the pattern? Because in actuality, the tabernacle was going to be a type of Christ. And God was teaching his people about the work that Christ would do through every aspect of the tabernacle. And so it was important that he made the right colors, made the right forms, made the right figures. Because every time, everything you look at in the tabernacle was a type and a fixture and a shadow of what Christ would be. And so for him to alter it and make it something that he wanted to be, it would break the type. And so Moses, I don't want you to break the type. Because when they look at this structure, this tent, it's going to teach them about me. Is it possible that God is trying to teach somebody that's watching you what it really means to be a Christian? What it means to be a follower? Two, from a few minutes ago, I said, you know what? One of the badges of Christianity is that we show love one to another. And so some people want to break the type. I ain't talking to nobody. I ain't got to do all that. You'll see people, when you try to speak to them, they make it a point not to speak to you. Hey, y'all know how I am. I, I'm just that. I'm going to make you speak. I'm going to walk right over to you. Grab, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do it. Because that's how we show Christian love. And when people walk past you or sit beside you or don't want to say nothing to you, they got a bad spirit. You got a bad spirit. You can't tell me that you love God whom you have not seen and then diss me who you see every day. And so every time we attack one another and go after one another and criticize one another, you are breaking the type. You are breaking the type because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave. God loved the world. And so when you watch Christians fighting each other on the internet and fighting each other on TV, that is not the love of God. That's not what we should be displaying. And every time we do that, we misrepresent God. Oh, I got to move on. Somebody say we can't misrepresent him. Let me talk to you about the glory. Last point. In this season, it's going to be important that you create, recreate, construct, or listen at this, deconstruct our lives. That you're going to have to have enough faith in what God is asking. That even if you built something that you take pride in, I'll tear it down if it's not what you want. I'll tear it down. Some of you have taken pride in putting money into building something that you want with your own hands, with your own plans, and you got the trust when God says, I don't want that. Take that down. Take it down. I want you to build this. I want you to create this. I want you to move your money over here. 
I want you to watch what you're getting involved in. I want you to pay attention to what you spend time on. And if it's something that I'm asking you to do, do you have enough obedience to God to construct what he is telling you to build? Oh, my God. Y'all quiet in here. This whole month of January, I hope that God is talking to you about your life. Before you start building and working and making commitments, God says, I want you to spend some time with me so that I can give you instructions. And do you have enough confidence in me that I know what I'm doing? That even if it runs contrary to what you thought, I'm going to get rid of it. Somebody's got to break up with somebody. I know you don't want to hear it. You already made the wedding invitations. You already introduced them to your parents. But in your spirit, you heard God say, she ain't the one. I'm sorry for the money I spent. I'm sorry I took you through all this drama. And nothing wrong with you. It's just that God said, this ain't the one. The greatest challenge that we have as Christians is choosing not between good and bad. I told you last week, it's between good and better and best. That sometimes what you're doing is good, but it's not the best. And if necessary, are you willing to throw away your program, tear up your list, change your itinerary? Because at the end of the day, we sung it earlier, I want your glory. Whatever it takes to get the glory, that's what I want to do. Can I tell you something? You don't have to beg God to show up if you give the man what he wants. Some of y'all here begging God, do this for me. You're begging, you're begging for God to show up. You're begging for God to do something. You don't have to do any of that if you just give the man what he wants. The reason why we have a worship service, the reason why we encourage you to worship God, to give God glory, to give God praise, because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And that, that, that word inhabit means to be enthroned. It means to create a seat. That when we begin to worship God, what happens is it creates a seat where God can come and sit in our midst. You don't have to beg God to show up at a worship service if you just open your mouth and give him praise and create a seat for him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We've had services in here that got where well, the power of God is coming so strong. We had to call Ubers and cabs for people because they were so drunk under the Holy Spirit. They would be staggering out of here. The place would just be in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a disarray. The whole place would collapse. Service be over. They'd still be crying and running around under the power of the Holy, Gear, of the, under the Holy Ghost. And some people come to church to see what's going to happen. I'm going to show up and see if God's going to do something this Sunday. But can I tell you what needs to happen? Every time you create an atmosphere, God will show up. Y'all don't hear me. Every time you create an atmosphere where you walk in and you in tend to create an atmosphere for God, God will show up. And you ain't got to pull, and you ain't got to prod, and you ain't got to beg, and you ain't got to cry, and you ain't got to do it in your life. If you want God to show up in your house, if you would intentionally just give him praise, God said, I'll show up. The reason I'm not showing up in your house, in your life, in your money is because you ain't gave me what I wanted. You ain't created a seat for me. You ain't gave me no place to dwell. But if you take 30 seconds right here and begin to give God praise, God said, I will show up. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it right here. Let's do it right here. Let's do it. You, you mad? You got an attitude? You going to be stubborn? I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to sit here like I'm in a movie. But God said, sit there if you want to. But everybody wants the glory to show up in your house and in your marriage and in your kids' life and in your money. Would you give God glory right here? Come on, let's do it. Come on, let's do it. I want it. How many people want his glory? I want his glory. I want his glory. Moses, when you do what I tell you to do, then the glory is going to fall. Somebody lift your hand and give him glory. It's intentional. You can't just do it when you feel like it. You can't just do it because you, you got to step over how you feel. You got to step.
step over what's going on in your body. You got to step over what happened in your marriage. You got to step over being mad at somebody. Grow up. Get over yourself and create a space for his glory. Come on, let's do it. I'm going to ride it till I break it. I'm going to ride it till I break it. You keep trying to be emotional about it. You keep saying, well, I want to see what's going to happen. I'm going to sit back here and make God. worshiping all day. The musicians going to worship. The praise team going to worship. The kids in the back going to worship because we're trying to get God in our midst. I need God in my money. I need God in my marriage. I need God in my family. I got a health issue and I need God in my... You can play if you want to, but I need God's glory in my heart. Yeah. You're almost there. You're almost there. You're almost there. You've been sitting like you've been in a movie, and you're thinking God's going to do everything, but there's going to be some assembly required. There's going to be some participation on your part to create an atmosphere where God can be glorified. Come on. Listen, the reason some of you don't get nothing out of worship service is because you don't know there's some, some requirement on your part. You want God to do everything. And so the Holy Ghost has to come into your service, put you in a headlock, snatch your hands up in the air, and then you'll get glory. That's not how that works. That's not how that works. You got to come in here and be intentional about giving him what he wants, and then my glory will show up. Oh, my God, the glory? Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we don't really want his glory. Maybe we just want your glory. You want to be promoted, given position, given power, given attention and prestige. But if anybody in here would humble yourself and lay down your crown and lay down your pride like they did in the book of Revelation where all the elders took the crowns off and they put them at Jesus' feet and said, you alone are worthy. When you take off your position and your title and your education and what you got on, and what's who's looking at you and say, God, I just want your glory. I, I, I'm going to give you glory if my hair weave come loose. I'm going to give you glory if my shoes break. I'm going to give you glory if somebody's looking at me funny. I got to give it. Is there anybody in here that wants to give God glory? Yeah, I'm going to ride it. I'm going to ride I'm going to keep on coming down your street. I'm, gonna keep, I'm trying to tell you how to tap in, Leah. This is how you tap. anyhow praise. You know what I'm talking about, Charlene? Y'all know what the anyhow praise is? And anyhow praise was, I didn't have everything I wanted. I didn't have a new, I didn't get a new boo. I, I didn't get, I didn't, I didn't get a new, uh, more money in my check. I, I, I didn't get a new car. I didn't get a new job. In fact, I didn't get 90, 50% of the things that I wanted. But when I got to church, I praised God anyhow. Not because of what he gave me, but because he's worthy. And some of you are in this seesaw relationship with God because when God does something great, you're in church leaping. And when he don't, you're depressed. And when you get a new boo, you come in church with your head up and having a good time. And when he don't, you want to sit back in the back. And when God opened the door for you, you want to shout all over the church. We can't even move on from make, trying to make you sit down. And when you don't get what you want, you want to come in and be funny. And you are not consistent in your praise. But uh, anyhow, praise was, even if I didn't get anything I wanted, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Pick me up, brother. I'm going to praise him anyhow. Is there anybody in here that's got an anyhow praise for God? I got struggles, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I got issues, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I got problems, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I've had trouble, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. Somebody give God an anyhow praise. Anyhow, 
They fought me, but I praise him anyhow. I got a bad doctor's report, but I praise him anyhow. My kids are acting crazy, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I had to catch a bus to church, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. My husband walked out on me, but I'm going to, y'all not going to do it. Y'all not going to do it. You act like you had a movie somewhere. But for everybody, I said, everybody. Listen, listen, listen. When Moses constructed the tabernacle, it says nothing about how he felt. They just built it. This had nothing to do with feelings or emotion. It was obedience. They just did it. And when they did what they were supposed to do intentionally, God's glory fell. <laughs> They didn't have to pray for it, Leah. They didn't have to argue for it. They didn't have to go out and fall out on the floor. You don't see none of that stuff going on. When they built it right, the glory showed up right. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody in here. If you give it to him right, his glory will show up right. Let, 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 let me show you how powerful it was. God's glory showed up so strong, Tina, that Moses couldn't even enter the place. It showed up so strong. The glory showed up so powerfully that they couldn't even come in the place because the glory was so strong. All for the day that God's glory fall in our church is so strong that you forget where you are. Don't tell me they having a better time in the club here in the church. The reason that is is because you haven't created an atmosphere for his glory to fall. Woo! My God, Lee, later on you'll read when Solomon built a temple according to the instructions that when they got done building it that the glory of God fell in that place so strong that the musicians couldn't play and the priests couldn't stand and the worship leaders couldn't even stand up in God's presence to create an atmosphere where God's glory falls so strong. God's into atmosphere. He's into atmosphere. He's into atmosphere. For you, it's a waste of time. For you, it's just demonstration. For you, it gets on your nerves. But when you see us praising God and worshiping God, we're trying to create an atmosphere. We're trying to create a place that's so strong. I'm looking for the glory to fall so strong that the preacher can't preach and the singers can't sing and the musician jump off the instrument because the glory of God. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Wait a minute, wait a minute. See, the problem with us is, is our appetite. Our appetite is messed up. The only time we get excited is if it's somebody famous. Has to be a famous singer or a famous preacher or somebody that's popular. So we don't come to church looking for God. We come to church looking for personalities. And God is so jealous because he will not share his glory with another. But I'm looking for the saints of God to get back to the place that we don't ask who's singing and who's preaching. Because the only person that matters in this place is Jesus. He's the only star of this show. I didn't come to see you. I didn't come to be seen. I came to give God the glory. Somebody. This room. I need glory on these microphones. I need glory on this praise team. I need glory on the band. I need glory in the sound room. I need glory. Oh, glory. Somebody take a walk with me and say, I need glory. I need glory. I need glory. I, I didn't come to be seen. I just need glory. I need glory in my money. I need God's glory in my marriage. I can't work this marriage out without you. I can't get this money together without you. Come on in, Jesus. Get all in my 
my business. Do what you want to do. Come on in my marriage. Do what you want to do. Get in my business. Get on my job. Get in my ministry. I just need the glory. Okay, Lord, I will say that. The Lord, the Lord just reminded me that the tabernacle was just a ruddy, humble, funny-looking tent. It wasn't even glamorous. It wasn't even glorious. But what it had was the glory. And some of you are so caught up in buildings and people and style and fashion that you're going to miss the glory of God. That the glory of God tends to find its way into small things, into humble things, in the things other people walk away and say, mm, look at that place. I would never worship there. I would never join there. Who's that pastor? Look at this praise team. They don't look like so-and-so on the album. They may not have but what they will have is the glory. Somebody shout glory. I need glory. I don't need talent. I need glory. I don't need ability. I need glory. If you get God's glory, it won't take as much work. Do you hear what I said? I need glory. Tell somebody. from under your burdens, how to get out of your struggle, how to get out of your issue. Sometimes it's not about you getting out of a situation. It's inviting God into a situation. How do I know? Because when Peter was in jail and they began to sing and to praise God, the Bible said that God shook the prison. It wasn't about trying to get out. It was about trying to get God in. If you open your mouth, God said, I will come in. Let me close with this, because I neglected to tell you this. Turn me down some. Let me. When Moses began to build the tabernacle, you don't read anywhere where he got a saw or a hammer or a nail. That what God did 
is that God began to stir up the gifts of certain people. Baziel and Aholiah specifically. And the Bible said that God anointed them with the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And they were craftsmen and they knew how to create stuff. So Moses had the plan, but they had the gifts. They had the skills, they had the talents, and not only did they have the ability, Sister Tina, one verse says he gave them the ability to teach. So it's not just what they did what they do, they started teaching other people how to do it. And when you got done, you saw a whole army of people, everybody in the place had something to do. The women were sewing, they were working on the building, they were putting things together. No was at the tabernacle looking but everybody was working somewhere I ain't done yet they were just as anointed to do what they do as Moses was to do what he do Moses was a gifted orator and a communicator but Basil and Aholiah were anointed to work with the material and they were just as anointed in what they do as he was in what he does because everybody in here God wants to use you and stir your gifts and use you to create an atmosphere where God can have glory. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. Push on somebody and say you too. You too. You too. You too. We need glory. So what's happening is What's happening is, and you can see this, you can see me doing this, you start seeing us moving things around. Because we're not looking for talented people, we're looking for anointed people. Everybody that's talented is not anointed. Just because you can sing don't mean you're anointed. Just because you can play don't mean you're anointed. Just because you can do whatever you do don't mean you're anointed. Because when you have the anointing to do something, you can create something that ordinary people can't create. And when we could, when I put my anointing with your anointing and his anointing and her anointing, and we bring all of our gifts and our talents together, all of a sudden we create an atmosphere and a place for God's glory to fall. Oh my God. Oh my God. Who am I talking to in here? Who am I talking to in here? We're where are my anointed people at in here? I didn't ask you, was you famous? I asked you, are you anointed? Do you have divine enablement? God wants you. What happens though, what happens though, what happens though is when, when, when we're anointed and, and we steal God's glory, then God gets mad. The only thing about being anointed is you have to watch the temptation to take all the credit for yourself. The only reason you can play is because God anointed you. The only reason you can work the sound room is because God anointed you. When you're anointed, you can't even explain why you know how to do what you do. You can just do it. I can administrate. I can preach. I can teach. I can sing. I can lead. I can't even understand how I can do it, Daphne. I can't even hardly teach it because there's an anointing. Touch somebody on your shoulder and say, God's going to anoint you. God's going to anoint you. When you get an anointing on your life, you can do what humanly, what humanly impossible to do. When you get an anointing on your life, it's not going to be as hard as you think. When you get an anointing on your life, it won't take as much time as you think. I need all of my anointing. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. God said, I'm going to give you an anointing. Lift your hands and say, Lord, anoint me. Oh my God, I feel something pushing in here. Somebody said, in here and you know you are the only thing you have to do is make sure you give the glory back to God I'm going home I said you got to make sure you give the glory back to God you give the glory back to God 
because you were able to do that job. You give the glory back to God because God blessed you to be able to play or to sing or to preach. You got to stop being a glory stealer and be to do what some people can. I may not be anointed to preach. I may not be anointed to sing as well as these singers do. I may not be able to tickle the ivories or play an instrument like they do. But the one thing I can do, the one thing I can do is I Give God praise. 
Anderson. Mark Brown, I'm at a place in my life. I'm at a place in my life where I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of having church as usual. Tired of following a program where you know everything is going to happen and they're going to do this at this time and then they're going to do that. I'm tired of watching gifts on display that don't have any anointing. And when you see me moving people around and changing people out and switching things up, it's because I'm looking for somebody who's got an anointing. Because when you have the right people who are working in your sound and your music and your singing and they are anointed, anointing simply means they are effective. You're not just entertaining me. You are breaking yokes. Revelation comes forth. Lives are changed. And I'm not doing it for ego. I've got a template. I got a template. Daphne, I got a boss that I got to report to. And so when I start moving people around and putting people in position, I got to go back to my boss and say, is this what you want? That, that, that's not who you want? That's, that's not what you want? Okay, I got to go back and change it. Because God says, if you give me what I want, you ain't got to beg me for my glory to show up in your house. Woo! Who hears what the Spirit of God is saying? Lift your hands if you want the glory. If you get the anointing in your life, you're not got to work as hard. You're wearing yourself out. You're exhausted. You've taken on all these projects that you're trying to do in your own ability. You're going to have to discern what is God calling for and what are you trying to do. And some of that stuff you're going to have to let go of. God didn't ask for it in the first place. But if you do what I ask you to do, there's an anointing. There's an anointing about to hit your finances. Y'all don't hear me in here. Ah, ah. When you have an anointing on your life, you ain't got to sell yourself out. You ain't got to sleep your way to the top. You don't have to cheat nobody. That goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. That the blessings of God is going to chase you down. If you learn how to get out of your feelings and stop trying to serve God with depending on your feelings, God said, I'll show up and I'll make it easy for you. Take my burden upon you because my burden is easy. My burden is light. Lift your hands. I feel a lift in here. I feel a lift in here. The glory doesn't just come to make you shout. It comes to take something off you. It comes to break a habit. It comes to change something. God doesn't talk all the time like we do, but when he does speak, he speaks at pivotal moments. God speaks at pivotal moments. Who's God talking to in here right now? If God is talking to you, it's because it's now time for you to make a change, to change directions, to turn left, to turn right, to turn around. Some of you are going to have to repent. Some of you are going to have to repent. Some of you are going to have to go back and apologize to somebody. Don't tell me that you're anointed to hear God talk about your money, but you don't hear God telling you you need to go apologize to him or apologize to her. And if you wonder why you're getting a power failure, it's because you ain't giving me what I want. And I'm not going to continue to bless your mess cussing your husband out and then you want anointed. God said, I ain't going to do it. You want the glory back in your marriage? You have to humble yourself. Oh, I got to get out of here. How many glory seekers I got in here? Where are you at? If you're a glory seeker, if you're a seeker of God's glory, you're not ashamed. Lift your hands. Let me see where you at. Can, can I challenge you? Can I take 30 seconds and do this? I want everybody who is seeking God's glory to rush this altar right now. Come on, rush this altar right here. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about a title. It's not about a position. I just need God's glory. While you're coming, I need your hands up. While you're coming, I need you worshiping. While you're coming, I need you in God's face. 
need your glory. I want your glory. Less of me. that we're going to end with it. I need you more. Come on, I need your heart in this. I need you more. Hallelujah. Less of me and more of you is what I need. Sing it from your heart. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Come on, I need everybody doing it. Show me your power. Less of me. If you get over yourself and open your mouth, I'll come in. Come on, I need you singing it. Come on, you got to do something on your part. I need, I need you. Come on, that's the part you do. This is the part you do. This is the part you do. There's some assembly required. Shut it. 